Thank you, Stephanie, and welcome, everybody. Welcome, Dianita and Gerhard Steidl. Um, I think everybody has a sense who Dianita is already, but there are a number of uh, terms with which you describe yourself, which I wanted to go through to begin with. So we get a better sense of your work and how it relates to the book and book building. So you are a photographer. You're a bookmaker. You are an offset artist. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Gerhard Steidl is a printer. Offset printer. Offset printer. And a publisher. But Dianita, when you refer to Gerhard, you like to call him, and these are quotes, either your accomplice or your co-conspirator, which makes book building sound a little bit sinister. Why do you call him these things? We are totally on the same wavelength for what we want to do with the book. We don't always have we, words to explain what we are doing, but I think when I walked around with Gerhard an hour ago, we, we both saw that we had really managed to do what we had set out to do, mm -hmm. which was to perhaps transform the book into an exhibition, to bring the book to the wall, to make the book the work itself and not a catalog or a reproduction of another work. And to have, you know, you can't ask, I mean, I couldn't do this without the kind of support that I had from Gerhard. And the secret to that was whenever I would say to Gerhard, Gerhard, can we put the gutter through the image or can we make a box? And he would say, no, uh, especially when I said, can we make a book with 88 different covers? He said, absolutely not. And I had learned to just keep quiet and not argue. And then he comes in the morning, clears his throat, and he says, okay, this time we try it. So it's always been this back and forth. So it's not something, I do make books on my own in India, some of them, but the level with which we can raise the bar with each time we make a book is unimaginable. I don't think either one of us can do it separately. When you come to Göttingen with a new book idea and you know that it's something which is difficult or ambitious or complicated, like nine accordion booklets in a fold-out box, do you know that you'll have to convince him about it? Or does he say yes straight away? Or what, how does that process He doesn't work? say yes straight away. It depends on his mood and how, uh, you know, what, what else he's doing. And, you know, he keeps me waiting like everybody else. Everybody thinks that I get special treatment. I don't. Um, for, for, for this book, he had me waiting for two weeks in Gottingen. And then last week, in a week, he printed and bound it and delivered it before the opening. So, you know, that's, I sort of have full faith in that. And that's how we make the books. No, I come with a plan. I have an idea. But I know that we are going to completely dislodge it. And Gerhard often says, but this is not how we make the book. You know, if I want to make a very traditional, then he says, this is not how we do it. And then I make some things. So it's a back and forth. We've never really completely disagreed on anything, except the title of the next book which I want to call birthing the book. And Gerhard says we should call building the book. So that's the only disagreement we have. But we don't know what he will say tomorrow morning. So let's see. So Steidel, when you first say, I'm not sure about the book and you sleep on it, are your reservations to do with the physical limitations of the book, the difficulty of making what Dianita wants, finding the binder to make such a book, those kind of things, or? <clears throat> no, the whole thing is more simple. Uh, throughout the day when I'm working, I'm uh, in my madness, and uh, then I follow just my instincts. And uh, when I'm in a bad mood, or when I'm pissed or so, then I say no. And when I'm in a good mood, I say yes. And uh, so um, it is, Mm, it is a method of working which I would say it is like children which are playing in the sand 
uh, on the beach and making a sandcastle and are totally lost in, in doing it. And then a big wave is coming and takes it all away and you start from zero. So throughout the day when I'm working, I'm not thinking about any values. I just uh, want uh, to have in a certain way fun and uh, I'm excited to look at new things. And um, when I say no to something, it, it is for me to find a gap for thinking. Yeah? So to overthink the technical matters, uh, which I have to solve if there is a crazy idea by the artist. Um, and uh, on the other hand, um, it is uh, inspiring my mind to offer to the artist uh, uh, a wider way of uh, looking to this project and uh, to bring in ideas the artist could not have because my, the definition of my work is that I'm a technician and a servant for the artist to help to realize um, her or his ideas. If you look at bookmaking today, perhaps since Museum Bavan, which has these accordion booklets, and paper has become more expensive, binderies are closing, making paper books is more difficult. Is it still a no compromise approach that you say we'll make it work somehow, or do you have to at some point say, it's too expensive to do hand binding, I can't find someone to do it? Mm. Making a good book was never easy because uh, you had to fight on all fronts with idiots who want to block it. Uh, so a wholesaler who is uh, delivering the wrong paper and saying, oh, that's the best one we have, and you know already it's not the best one, he just makes a mistake because he delivers the wrong pallet. And then you go uh, to a bookbinder and the bookbinder has not fun uh, to make the complicated things because it makes him a headache. Um, and uh, so you have to convince him or her uh, to make it the way you want. And um, But uh, today there are other complications uh, driven. We are, uh, yeah, have to fight uh, with uh, inflational uh, costs and uh, the raw materials you need for making a book. Um, but to make a book as an object of art, or uh, as I'm saying, uh, a book is a multiple, an industrial produced object, but inspired or designed and created by the artist is a relatively uh, cheap object when you compare it with buying a Porsche car or something like that. Um, and uh, you can Mm, compare it with uh, the hood cuisine. So there is a chef uh, who has uh, his or her restaurant and the uh, first step is to finding the best uh, food and farmers who are growing vegetables and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, cattle uh, to get the best beef and that is more expensive than other things. And uh, then uh, it is handmade and uh, it takes a lot of time uh, to pro produce uh, everything um, uh, really highly individual. And at the end you have to pay by today 150 euros for a meal with a glass of wine or two. And it's the same with the book. Uh, the, the costs are higher to make a book by today, but at the end, when you compare it with other uh, luxury goods, and for me a book is a luxury good with a democratic price, it is relatively cheap. So Dionysia, why is this collaboration not just book making, but book building? What's the difference? For me, book building is a way of dealing with your images. All of us who make lots of photographs uh, make a lot of images. And I have found through my uh, time with Tidal that it's just a way of gathering and organizing your material, this thing that I call book building. Then it might become a projection it might become a museum, it might become a book. So I am saying that book building is a way of dealing with photography. So it doesn't need to result in a book? Not at all. 
but it's a methodology that I apply even to this exhibition. So it just so turns, it just so happens that Gerhard is going to make an, a book out of almost each of these rooms. But I, I think about the rooms and I think about this exhibition in the way that I think about books. Then the images sort of decide how large they want to be, how mobile they want to be. But the beginning, I would say half the work happens on this, these long tables, exactly like how you make a book. Mm -hmm. And then the different forms emerge. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the physical process of book building, so that's you at a big table with a pair of scissors and it's either the prints or printouts and you cut and you arrange and everything. Is that a process which you think is only important for you or is it a process you would recommend to all photographers? It's a process that I highly recommend to every person trying to make a book especially. I can smell a book that has been made on the computer. When I'm touching it, I can tell that this has been made on InDesign um, and a book that has had a paper maquette will have a very different feel. But I must admit, and tell you a very funny story of 2002 and how I learned this process was when Gerhard Steidl had offered, when he printed the Mona Ahmed book, he met me outside Fritz Street Gallery where I was having an exhibition. And so this sort of quite gruff man walks up to me and I was young and you know, cigarette and red wine and velvet trousers. And Gerhard says, hello, I'm Gerhard Steidl. Next time you want to make a book, you better make sure you're at press. If your publisher is too poor, I give you the flight, but you have to be at press to make a book. And he walked off. And I don't believe, Gerhard, you even saw the exhibition. You just came to tell me this. And so I thought, who the, you know, like, who is this person? So then cut to 2002, Hamburger Bahnhof, Britta Schmitz uh, said, who are we, Britta is here today. It's a great honor for me to have Britta and Stephanie both in the audience as so many friends. So Britta Schmidt said that, you know, you're my publisher at that time. Scarlo has now gone bankrupt. What do we do? Um, there are so many publishers in Germany. And I said, well, let's try Steidl. And she said, you know, Dainita, this is your first book. You may, you know, major book, you might be a little too young for Steidl as yet. So I said, no, but he told me uh, to call him, so let's call him. And uh, Britta called him, and Gerhard said, yes, I do it, come on such and such date, and put the phone down. And so Britta and me got into the train from Berlin, we arrive in Göttingen, meet Gerhard, and he looks at Britta and he says, yes, um, so she says, I'm the curator, this is Dainita. He said, thank you very much for bringing her. I prefer to work with the artist. And so Britta left and left me in the hands of Gerhard. And Gerhard said, I, I had taken him like a, my idea of what a dummy was at that time. And he said, no, 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 we start from the beginning. You give me all the images. He brought me little prints and little printouts and these long, beautiful long scissors that Gerhard has that nobody else has. And he said, now cut each print and then gave me A4 size sheets and said, paste it. And I was horrified that, you know, in the year 2002, that I was sitting and cutting these photos and then, and he said, don't worry about how untidy you cut, just cut it and just do it. And I was, I was terrified, you know, Britta had left and I was there in Steidelville and so I did it. And I saw in that process how the work developed. And then Gerhard would come in and in those days Gerhard had much more time. And so we really built privacy together and we built it as four or five movements. You know, so Gerhard became this conductor and we were making these little compositions and then moving things around on that famous lunch table of uh, Gerhard's. Mm -hmm. So that process is something I highly rock recommend even to writer friends, to make printouts, to cut them up and to paste them. There is something about doing 
and maybe Gerhard has better explanation for this, of the actual cutting and pasting that I believe shows in the books. You can tell in any of my books that it's really made by hand until the last stage. Mm -hmm. And is that process, I mean, privacy was about two decades ago. Is that the same? Is that how the new book, Let's See, was made? How did that start? Absolutely. Uh, and I had, in this case, it was I had printed A4 sheets and pasted them together back to back and brought them to Steidl with, you know, expecting that things would change as they always do. And then, you know, sometimes if you catch Gerhard at the right time, he really gets it in a flash. And he said, that's the book we're going to make. And it was the same with uh, Dream Villa, with all the books. There's there's this flash that somehow comes to him where he knows that's it. And he, at other times, we struggle and struggle, like with Dream Villa. And every time I showed him something, and this is with a television crew, and he said, this is not us. We don't make books like this. We meaning him and me, right? So we have to try it differently, and it's square images. What do you do? Put it on the left side, right side. They're married for a forever, what do we do? So at that time I got really irritated with Gerhard. I don't often get irritated because the skill to being with Gerhard is having immense patience. But I thought I'm going to show him. So I took the square images and I cut them in half and I pasted them next to each other. So the gutter was going right through the images and the TV crew was waiting because they knew that he would say, you know, this is, this is ridiculous. Nobody makes books like this. He came in, he looked at it. He said, yeah, this is the book we make. And that's the book that we have, Dream Villa. Mm -hmm. So it's these, there's a lot of preparation, I think, certainly on my part. And then there are these absolute flashes of genius when we both realize that yes, we are onto something. And I think it's very clear to me, certainly, that with each book, we never want to repeat ourselves. We always want to try something new with the book. So when I wanted to make Museum Bhavan as nine accordion fold books, having made Center Letter, Gerhard at first was like, but I don't like to repeat anything, you know that. And then he understood how badly I wanted the museums and, you know. In terms of the step between the maquette and the finished book, how does that work? So how does, let's see, end up being the book with this particular paper, which has a kind of, the feel of a, a novel, the binding, which is like a paperback. How does that work between you both? You know, it's, it's amazing how closely uh, Gerhard listens to the artist when he listens. It's like soaks in 110%. So not even everything that I'm saying, but more than that. So we met, I think last week or 10 days ago, when Gerhard uh, came to Berlin and we were going to discuss the paper. And on the phone we were trying and it wasn't working. So when he came, I said, Gerhard, I want a book like a photo novel. So I wanted to have the feel of paper, but like a cheap paperback. And so Gerhard just told me that inside, or Gerhard can talk about it himself, but the feel of the book, I, I talk to Gerhard about, and then it says expertise with the paper and the inks, and I said that I wanted a book that existed more in the mid-tones, and it's remarkable what he did. And it's exactly what I wanted, you know, the idea of a book that you read on a train or a plane that you flip through, but I wanted people to read it like they would a book of text. And it had to feel like that. You couldn't do that with a big hardbound book. So he found the cheapest, to make it look like, a, almost like a thriller. Uh, just the right paper, the weight, smell, all I of it. I think when you see it lying on the table, you expect there to be text inside, but then there's not. Sorry? You expect text to be inside, yes, but there's not. Yes, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But we wanted that. We are, yeah, I think we both like to tease the audience a little bit, shift them a little bit, subvert the market a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then a, a technical question for Steidl. So it's a soft cover book, but if I'm, if I'm right, it's the Otterbind binding. 
What, what does that mean and, and why do you choose that specifically? So, um, uh, once the idea was born, and here I'm using the word born, birthing, um, uh, you have to accept if we keep this uh, image that there is a mother and a father who is birthing a child, or in this case, uh, birthing a book, um, you have to accept uh, that there is a per certain personality existing uh, which cannot be changed. If you want to change your child, then it ends up normally not in a good way. So you have to give space uh, that this book or the child can uh, walk into the world. So, and um, my instinct said to me that for this subject as, of photos and uh, as she has arranged them and uh, just by chance, uh, I think you have not been sitting down for months uh, to assemble them. It was more a spontaneous uh, reacting. Um, you have ju just to add the right materials and uh, I had of in, in mind how this stuff was looking. It was harder <coughs> to find cheap papers. Uh, so for the for inside, I was using an uncoated 110 grams bulky paper, which is what is normally used for the cheapest uh, pocket books, crime fiction, or whatever. And outside, the cover material is something I had never used in my life uh, for a book uh, before. Uh, it is called, the cardboard is called GD2, and uh, it is used for making um, the wrapping of uh, beer six packs. Yeah, so outside it should look nice, what it is, and inside is just the cheapest uh, raw cardboard what is available. And uh, this mixture of accepting, uh, yeah, something what comes up spontaneously makes a good book. And um, just to say one thing uh, from the beginning of your answer to Monty was uh, you said um, when a book is composed on a screen, uh, it begins <coughs> to go wrong. Uh, my advice is really uh, to start a book from the beginning analog. So have something on paper in your hands, spread it out on the desk and all the the all the time you are spending with this materials and you have it in your fingers and so on gives you a sense what at the end when it comes to realization from when the idea comes out of the brain onto paper and into a bound book this all uh, is a learning process uh, which you should not miss um, if you <coughs> decide to make everything on a laptop or on a screen um, and it goes then directly into the hands of a printer who does not know the process before it goes wrong. And in most cases uh, it is going wrong and for most of the artists it's, uh, when the book is ready it is a, a bitter disappointment and not a pleasure. To get back to the beginning of book building for Let's See, so Let's See is a look into your archive revisiting old old photographs and Museum Bavan for example is different it's got within it smaller museums the museum of little ladies of printing presses or whatever is the beginning the same for every book project regardless of the subject how do you know that the photography will become a book I don't actually um, I think in all these years, I've built an ear for photography. Uh, so I have learned to listen to the images. The beginning is always with book building as a, the process. Small prints on a table, regardless of whether it's an exhibition or whatever it might become. But it starts with the little prints. And maybe halfway through, I know whether this is going towards a book or it's going towards becoming a museum or a projection or something else. 
the beginning is always book building, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to become a book. Right. Um, another thing which has always fascinated me about books with you, I would say that the, the standard photographer or artist makes a book, the creative part with the publisher, and then the book is out in the world, and the next step, the selling, the marketing, the promotion, the advertising, is something which the photographer lets the publisher do. But you, you love to do it yourself. Absolutely. Uh, to me, designing and selling are all part of being a book artist. And so the selling part, I believe I have to create the desire for the book. I have to be talking about the book. Um, I'm not going to wait for Steidl to present my book to uh, th the distributors in India, for example. You know, they have their own reasons for why they, they just want a book maybe on Taj Mahal, and that's not really my expertise. So I have to create my own market. And I've got Instagram, but before Instagram, also I was doing, I believe we photographers, artists, have to present our work to the people. And so even though you pay for the book, I still believe I'm giving you a gift. Um, I think I sold more boxes. The, the distributor in India imported these boxes from Gerhard. And he wasn't able to place them because in a bookshop, this didn't make sense. This box, it was taking up too much space on the shelf, Gerhard. Like the bookshop people said they could put three books instead of this box. And so they were not interested. And I just made my own events. Anybody invited me, I said, sure. But you know, I have to show Museum Bhavan. Um, so you would make nine shelves for me. I would come, I would install it. And in half an hour, all the books I had would be sold. So it's not that I, I have a special expertise in selling. It's just, I think, people, how do we make a desirable object that people would want to have? Uh, I did it again, I think I tried to do it with the uh, special edition that we made for the Gropius Bau catalog where the insert is separate and the reader is separate till the catalog gets published. So it's all about imagining how is someone going to walk into the bookshop and how are they going to be drawn to this and then making bags which will become a continuation of that project. So, you know, everyone who's bought the edition today, and I see some here, they'll use the bag when they travel elsewhere as well. So the publicity is happening for the book. And with Instagram, I have yet to announce, uh, let's see. But I feel that the design, as well as the sell selling, is part of making books. And people who make photo books, art books, um, can perhaps think of engaging with that aspect as well. And after I made the box, uh, and I made the shelves, and I made the exhibitions, even that was not enough. And so finally, I decided I would become the museum myself. And so I, would, I made a jacket uh, with nine pockets. And in the, in the book that Gerhard and I are making next, which is either book building or birthing the book. Um, we'll see. There is a DIY for how you buy a jacket or a kurta. What about the other side? Never give up. Um, so, so there's a whole... Um, DIY in that book on how to make your own nine pocket jacket. So first buy the Museum Bhavan box and then make your own jacket or make your own shelves. My life as a museum. So, so the more time I spend with the books, um, the more ideas I get. And you know, the book is out of print now. I don't know if Gerhard is going to reprint it, but the ideas don't stop. I can't help it. So I've already got more ideas on what we can do with the book, but now we need the book. So it's, it's not simply selling, it's moving the work further to more people, to more people's hands. Yes, because I think while I love to be in the Gropius Bau and in, in 
the institutions. It's a huge privilege for me, for my artwork to be alive in your house, Monty. Alive. So I don't want to be a book on your bookshelf. I don't want to be a print on your wall. I want to be this object that even if you don't play with, guests will come and play with, that you could have an exhibition um, whenever you like. You, in the garden, in your kitchen, in your bathroom, in your hotel room, on a train or a plane, anywhere. And to me, that's what art is. Dissemination is very much a part of art. So if we can make books that we can disseminate in this way, when we made Museum of, a Museum of Chance, which you see behind me, this is actually a very good example of what happens uh, when Steidl and I work together. In front of me and behind you is the Museum of Chance, this big wooden structure with 162 prints, which is, this is an exhibition copy, and the original is in the collection of MoMA. Now, how many times will MoMA show it in my lifetime? I don't know. Um, once, maybe twice. But then behind me is the book where I asked Gerhard to make me a book with 88 different covers. And somehow he just got it. Um, and so we had that book. I kept some sets and he kept two sets. Three. Three. And then I made a suitcase museum out of them. So 44 books travel in two suitcases. They have a front and a back, and they're here. And really, what I've realized in this exhibition, and I'm sure Gerhard will agree with me, that for the first time, we're really seeing the books at the same level as the work. The books are the work. That each room, whether it's a book or a museum, has the same power, I think. The book is not a little room on the side anymore, I think. It's not an appendix to the work. Yeah. yeah. I always have to smile because when, when you take the book and you exhibit it, so when the book becomes the exhibition, as a visitor within a museum, you can't touch it. It's, there's a different set of rules. But you can leave the exhibition, go to the bookshop, buy the book, take it home, you become the curator, the exhibition continues. Absolutely. The Zakir Hussain maquette, which is in that room, um, that is really, that we, we have really succeeded there, Gerhard, because there are no prints. There is no other form for that work. There are maybe three or four prints in the Museum of Chance, but for the rest of the work, you could run the biggest Kunsthaus in Germany, but if you say to me, can I have those works uh, as prints? They're just no prints. You have to buy the book, so you buy the Zakir Hussain maquette, you buy 12 copies, if you buy 44 copies, you have the full exhibition. And after the exhibition is over, for one day, one week, one month, you can sell the book again. And maybe for a little more price, because now it has a provenance. And so we had hoped, we since sent a letter, that there would be a way to make the book into an exhibition. And now we have the Zakir Hussain maquette, which is that is the exhibition form. There is nothing else for that work. And um, just uh, to make a compliment uh, for this show, um, I'm doing books and I'm curating each year approximately 50 exhibitions around the globe. All are related to photography and books. And what I find important is uh, that uh, there is a relatively inexpensive way uh, to present uh, photography and art um, because uh, a young generation by today who is experienced to use uh, photos uh, every second on the iPhone to look at it and to select. So the bad ones are deleted right away and the better ones are kept and the highlights are kept for a long time. So the, the visual education by today is much better than years before. And it is not, from my point of view, it is not any important anymore uh, that the museum show uh, is showing the best uh, um, vintage prints uh, signed uh, by Cartier Bresson or Robert Frank. Uh, so it is just the content which goes to the wall. And if a book is perfectly made and built, built up, 
um, then there is no reason that it makes its way directly onto the walls of a museum, so from the book to the wall. And uh, the, you can study in this exhibition that the structures, which are very simply done, the, the design is, is excellent because it does not become art what you have done. It is a, a functional furniture for presenting books, photos, and to sell books and photos. And some of them jump onto a wall. They are not framed. They are simply nailed with pins stuck to the wall. And you have a wonderful experience that uh, photography uh, and books are coming from the same resource, and that's paper. Mm -hmm. One uh, well, another term that you both use for the things that you make, that they're not just books, but they're book objects. Does that just have to do with three-dimensionality? So is that a book object, or can is Let's See also a book object? What, what do you mean by that? Book object. Um, uh, actually, I learned it uh, from Joseph Boyce when I was... Uh, assisting him to build up his exhibitions. Uh, he asked me, he, he, he heard that I'm a printer, and he asked me, okay, uh, I need uh, something to be done uh, for a, a museum show. Um, can you help me to release it? And he explained it to me uh, without making a real maquette. So it was more a dialogue between him and me. And uh, the, uh, I worked it out. I showed it to him. He criticized it. I rebuild it, uh, make a new construction up to the moment it was ready. And at the end, uh, there was an object created and uh, designed by the artist and but produced uh, with industrial methods printing methods and binding and so on um, normally in the book industry or in the book making industry the artist is welcome just to deliver the idea and uh, the process ends uh, with uh, signing the contract in the office of the publisher uh, and uh, going to dinner and then the artist uh, goes home and uh, the processes start uh, so uh, the book design is maybe done in London uh, and uh, the uh, repro works uh, scanning or digital photography digital repro photography is done in India um, then the printing is made in China uh, the materials are coming from here and there and uh, and then uh, it ends up in a warehouse sitting there that it is delivered uh, to the the bookstores and um, nobody is, has controlled this process and uh, as I said before in normally uh, the book at the end is bad and not worth uh, to exist um, uh, the, the, the th it needs a change of thinking uh, in the publishers printers brains uh, to accept that the idea which is given by the artist to make a book must be respected up to the end of the production. And then uh, books are more exciting and they are, as we can, as we have the proof here at the Gropius Bau, a they can jump directly onto the wall and make simultaneously a beautiful show. And when you have, for example, in the Zakir Hussain maquette room, because we have offset printed works, we can have this incredible daylight. And it's ironic that photography, which is a medium of light, always needs to be shown in such sleepy 50 lux light. Yeah, but uh, here I have to say you are the perfect uh, uh, subject uh, for make a photo exhibition 
uh, which uh, can be shown at uh, daylight and sunlight. So uh, her work is 90% uh, of the work. 95% of the work is black and white photography. And um, of printing, as printers always want to get it printed the cheapest way, printing of photography is normally done uh, by today in uh, four color process. So all the digital uh, machines which are printing uh, photos have four colors, a black for contrast, a cyan, a blue, a magenta, a red, and a yellow. And out of this, they compose black and white photos. What we are not doing at Steidl. So uh, black and white photography uh, is produced uh, the old-fashioned way um, in tritone or quadratone. What is a tritone or what is black and white photography printing? You can print it single black. Uh, that is a very poor simulation uh, of a photo because you are missing the highlights and uh, you are missing the midtones and uh, you are missing structure in uh, the uh, dark sections. So uh, if you want to make it better, you print it in duo tone, then it is a black and one gray. If you want to make it even better, then you make it in tritone. You print it one black, one gray, and one light gray and one dark gray. And the best way to do it is quadrotone, then you have two blacks and one gray and one black. And out of this, you can compose it really perfectly that the tonality the artist wants to have. I'm not saying that the tonality we never pr reproduce the tonality uh, uh, one to one as it can be found in a negative or in a print. Um, we had seen there a perfect proof uh, that we made a repro uh, 15 years ago from a photo print of her. Uh, and the photo print is not bad, but it is not good. And the print we did in offset she, together with me, is much better. And the benefit of Offset printing, when it is made uh, in black and white, is uh, that the black and the gray ink never fades away. Uh, when you see uh, billboards outside, uh, after a while it is only black and cyan, the blue, what, should, what is left, and the fragile uh, pigments of uh, magenta red and yellow have been faded away. Uh, black and white Stephanie can have the prints up for one year in the bright sunlight. It will not change. And so offset is a wonderful printing technique for museum prints and sunshine. Dianita, I read once when someone asked you what advice you would give to a young photographer or a young bookmaker, and you said that they should go and study literature. How does that relate to book building? Why, why literature? Um, I think of photographs as the raw material for what I do. Well constructed, well thought of, but still the raw material. And to use the chef analogy that Gerhard made, you know, it's, you can't be a chef by just putting all your raw material on the table. It's what kind of a cuisine you want to create out of it. And so you want, to, you want to do something with those images. And you want, for me, photography is even more about dissemination rather than being about the image. But in the photo world, and here we might disagree, but for me, the photo world is very boxed in. There are very fixed ideas of a print in a mat, on the wall, uh, 50 lux, a photo book, single image. You know, there's quite fixed ideas. And we see it the most in photo festivals. And I know that photography is vast. It has so many possibilities, endless possibilities. And I feel that even in the exhibition of photographies, we have only touched maybe 5%. So where are we going to get new thought into photography? And that's when I started to tell people to do an MA in literature and then come to photography so that they would have another language to 
to look to. And so when I call, I now call, let's see, a photo novel. I would love for there to be a time when within the photo book, there are different genres like biography, like fiction, like poetry. But we just think of photography and we think of photo book. And so I feel literature shows us not just different forms and how, of course, how to tell the story, but most of all, editing. And for me, the master of editing, if any young artist, photographer here wants to understand editing, uh, read Michael Ondaatje, for example, and read Siebald, and just how, what is retained, what is not expressed clearly, what is left dangling, and we need to bring all of that kind of thinking into the photo book. So a book I would recommend to everyone is called Conversations. It's Michael Ondaatje in conversation with the great film editor, Walter Murch. It's like a Bible for making a photo book. Which one? Museum of Innocence. Exactly. And I'm, it's just an interesting story maybe to say here. I don't know if you know this, Gerhard, but I made, I was, when I read Museum of Innocence, I was completely swept away because I, like everybody else, thought it was written for me. And, you know, that somehow Pamuk had gone inside me and he understood me. And so I've, I must admit, I fell in love with Kemal. And I thought, while Kemal is crying for the big love of his life, why don't I meet Kemal when he goes to the uh, King George Museum in Chennai? And then I show these photographs uh, to Kemal and I make a work called Museum of Innocence Madras Chapter. And so I actually took Pamuk's text and inserted my own texts into it till his publisher said, you know, you might like to run this past Pamuk before you show it publicly. So I went to Pamuk, he loved the idea, he said, you use a different font for your words and a different font for my words. And so we have a work called Museum of Innocence, Madras Chapter, which with this text, which is a combination of Pamuk and me. But Pamuk is, it's interesting that you bring up Pamuk because he, he, was, he was one of the first people who saw my file room work. He saw little prints in my house just, just lying there because I, had, I was showing them to someone. And he said, this is the most important thing you're going to do. You just have to go back to the archives. I was going to Bogota at that time. He said, forget Bogota, forget everything else. Just focus on these archives. So somehow in my life, literature has played a big role, but writers as well. Um, and, you know, much more than with colleagues in photography or in photo museums or photo galleries. Somehow I feel I find the world of literature and cinema and now architecture much more easier to be in conversation with, to really take things apart and to push the limits of what photography can be. So of course at the heart of it is photography and all my questions come from photography. But it, we need to push it out of all these boxes. And we need to push the photo book out of the boxes too. All right. I think, uh, well, I think I could happily stay here all afternoon and chat, but uh, Q&A is yet what we need to be doing. So if anyone would have any questions that they'd like to ask Dianita or Gerhard about book building or anything at all. Yeah, this is the chance. Please address everything to Gerhard, because at least for 10 minutes we have him here. It's a rare opportunity. Why well, don't there's a, a microphone coming? Soll ich auf Deutsch oder Englisch sagen? English. Okay, I'm creating a sort of book space in, in front of... Um, uh, we have a kind of small exhibition space, project space, and also there's a, there's a cafe and an, an urban garden and lots of things happening in, in a very strange, brutalist building I built in the other side of uh, Berlin. And I'm English, by the way. Um, 
and uh, you, you know the space. It's it's it, it, it's got a very strong brutalist architecture. And we're now going to do as people come in straight straight away is this little archive section. I mean, it's like a kind of book space. I don't know how to describe it. I don't know yet how I'm going to curate it. I just am building the shelves, um, which are... I want people to be in the shelves sort of thing. And I'm just wondering um, this... Also the kind of different roles between what... How the public can be absorbed into a space where they can feel they can take take books and sit down. There has to be somewhere to sit. There has to be, you know, obviously, can you take your coffee there? There's all these sort of elements. And I think that there can be more smaller, looser institutions that absorb book spaces. Um, and how, how would you uh, give me some advice? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, many or most of the exhibitions I'm uh, curating uh, have to do with um, with uh, photos and with books. And um, I designed um, a small table, which is just uh, 60 centimeter wide, 40 centimeter deep. And it is very simply made out of metal, uh, black metal, um, and uh, behind it is a cheap uh, IKEA stool, uh, also made from uh, black wood. And on top of it is a book on display. And uh, there were approximately 20 years ago uh, a designer's group called Droog in the Netherlands. And uh, the artwork they did, or the design work they did, was called Droog Design. And th they desi designed a wonderful lamp made out of porcelain, very simple, and with a red electric rope uh, uh, which delivers electricity from the ceiling that's hanging above it with a, with a tungsten lamp. And so that makes a perfect scenario for reading a book. You have just one book, nobody, one, one book on your own desk. Uh, nobody is sitting next to you and there's a beautiful light on top of it which illuminates it. And um, it is, you know, uh, reading a book, looking to a book, it's all about uh, being concentrated and have the right atmosphere. It needs to be nice. So uh, what are you doing if you are a reader? You have your beloved uh, uh, reading sofa or reading uh, chair and a glass of red wine at a nice light and uh, a good fire uh, or a warmness in uh, in the winter. And <clears throat> what I saw today, I have not seen it before, Dianita, is your uh, um, uh, construction for such, uh, for creating uh, uh, the perfect atmosphere to read a book. Um, it is, uh, you see it, you have to go around. Um, it is a small uh, wooden construction, approximately the same size as my metal thing, and we never spoke about it, so it is just a coincidence that it is coming together. And uh, she has improved it because she set up a cabin around, like we have it at uh, elections, when you make your cross at the certain party so that nobody can look above your shoulder. And when we were working through, there was a guy sitting in, reading, and I looked over his shoulder and I disturbed his intimacy uh, when he was together with just his beloved books and I felt guilty. So that's the way how you have to present books, if you ask me. Yes, here. Thank you to take my chance as an independent publisher on photo books. Um, you, uh, Gerhard, you said that uh, photo books are a luxury product. And uh, my question would be, uh, now with uh, the missing of papers, everything gets more uh, expensive. Um, I always think that photo books are uh, analog media, now in a digital age, and we have to find a possibility to transport it to uh, a, another audience, not only to the bubble of photo book lovers, because the development of photo books going straight on and on with your work, with other independent publishers, and it's another kind of truth in the digital age. But do you think we have a chance to get this media out of this corner of luxury niche, and how? Um. 
there are some types of uh, books I really don't like. Uh, those are uh, most of the uh, books of uh, Taschen publishers because uh, those are honest. I'm not talking about the contents. Normally, the contents of Taschen books are very good. And sometimes I'm surprised uh, uh, that you get... Uh, 300, 400 pages, uh, very well printed uh, for such uh, for uh, 98 euros or what? Yeah, uh, but um, normally I, I I don't want to discredit another publisher, but uh, I don't like this form. And uh, when you go further, all the pub most of the publications galleries are doing for their exhibition shows um, have the same concept. So they are made for. Uh, uh, wealthy people uh, to announce uh, or uh, yeah or, yeah to announce uh, the artworks which are available for a certain price so it is a sales catalog and uh, the books we have in mind uh, are um, individual uh, objects of art multiples and um, uh, I have to say it is uh, also for me a learning process so when I started uh, the books were very simple out made out of cheap materials actually I had not too much knowledge about the material so I was using bad sometimes bad ones not always but sometimes bad ones and uh, after a while it was falling apart or it was fading away now that I have much more knowledge I can use uh, simple materials which are asset free and where I 100% know this is an object of art which will survive at least 200, 300, 400 years of more, like the Gutenberg Bible. And um, so when you do all this cooking, uh, the question is, where does it end? Uh, it never ends, so you can, you can buy ingredients to make a book uh, that the book object goes up to 300, 400, 500,000 euros. And who can buy that? Um, sometimes, it makes sense. So uh, we published recently uh, from Gilles Perez uh, his Opus Magnum um, uh, about uh, th uh, um, uh, the war in uh, North Ireland, uh, which are uh, two big volumes of a thousand pages and a reader of a thousand pages, and it has to be packed in a shopping bag. So the whole thing is in multiple, and it costs 500. So it is worth when 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 you buy uh, the the experience and uh, the research of a reportage photographers who invested uh, 25 years, 30 years of his life into this project. Um, but or but the main part of the production of uh, a publishing house should have democratic prices. And uh, for the moment, I'm doing a lot of efforts uh, to find materials which are inexpensive, but deliver a certain uh, luxury, you know, like like a, a, a simple corn bread, which costs almost nothing, could be as delicious uh, than uh, a croissant, which costs uh, 10 times more. Uh, so, um, and um, I think books should be smaller. Times have changed, people are traveling a lot. Nobody will take a book from uh, Tokyo uh, to his hometown in Germany when it has a weight of uh, 19 kilos, what some books easily have. And um, and uh, the new concept, I think, for books is that you have simple materials. So, no, I start from the wrong end. It needs an artist who understands that he delivers the content for the book exclusively for this book and maybe later on to go onto a wall but that the book is not an accompanying part of a, a gallery show it is an indie independent object. And uh, we in this uh, printing and publishing industry should not forget that uh, the 
artist is our work giver. Without delivering uh, intellectual content, uh, we had nothing to do and uh, our work was not worth to be um, on market. <clears throat> so uh, that's the first thing. Then the second thing is printing, uh, which is something what is going to disappear by today because printing industry is dying. Printing is essential for making a good book and the paper where it is printed on. And of course the binding, so the, the craftsmanship of, on it. And uh, this bundle of know-how makes the good object. And um, in the beginning of printing books and uh, publications, uh, the printer was uh, the advisor for the creator or for the uh, for the customer how to make the book. This knowledge is gone. Uh, what it needs is a young generation of uh, of technicians and book lovers who create the new book. I think it is a, what we have by today is a change like a Bauhaus, yeah? where another thinking was coming up. Uh, and uh, we, we have this, wie sagt man auf Deutsch, Kipppunkt, nicht? Kipppunkt, turning point, yeah? uh, reach today. Uh, and what uh, depends on books and bookmaking something is changing in the mind of people, in a good way, I think. And um, as a customer, when you go to a bookstore, uh, try to buy those books and help those printers and publishers uh, to survive in difficult times. All right. Any more questions? The back. Um, thanks for that uh, fantastic uh, session. I'm just wondering, you know, the comparison with literature, I found that very fascinating, uh, the comparison of, of thinking about photography as, as literature. Or, and I was actually um, uh, listening to Rachel Cusk the other day, and somebody asked her, how do you know when a book is done? How do you know when it's finished? And she uh, thinks for a bit, pauses, and then says, when I run out of space on the page. Uh, and for me, uh, when I think about, uh, especially in this exhibition, which of course you know have um, uh, been completely um, uh, taken by, is how does one, especially with photography, where you literally create space with every image, you can conjure it. How how do you know when a book is done? <laughs> I have. Um... I have a special term to it, uh, <laughs> um, because um, when we announce a book and saying the uh, and in the in the book cat in uh, our um, uh, book advertisements is said uh, the book will be published in, in uh, November, people are waiting for it. So it's not coming in November. Uh, people look again in January and February or one year after, book is still not there. And then we get pissed emails and people saying, what are you doing? How the fuck uh, co uh, this comes? And, um, and I work with an artist always as long as I want. We take all of our time uh, to make a book ready. And in the moment we think it is ready, it is ready. Therefore, I say the book is ready when it is ready, and so long you have to wait. And it is a form. It is, it is a kind of. It is a kind. Of, for me, it is a kind of instinct to set the point that it can go on press, and um, even if it's sometimes printed, and the formula for the binding or for the cover is not right, then it sits another, then the sheet sits another uh, six months in the warehouse and are waiting for the uh, inspired idea of the, of the book, of the cover design. So um, technically there is, yeah, the creators have to decide uh, when it is ready. And the, the, the simple answer to your complicated question, I mean, uh, it is really, you can talk endless about it, is uh, follow your instinct. I think uh, it's a, a great 
question we have to end, unfortunately, but I'd like to get Dianita's answer as well. And when you make the maquette, how do you know you're done? How do you know you've reached the last chapter? Is it intuition or how, how, do, you, how do you know? Yes, it, it's actually the same as what Gerhard said. It's, you just know it. You make, you struggle and you struggle and let's see, it took almost a year to compose. So if it looks like chance, it's, it's a compliment, but it took a really long time to compose. And then at a certain time, you just know, yes, now it's ready. That's when there's, when you, I go through a big process. So you try lots of things and you might come back to what you started with, but somehow you have to go through a whole cycle. And then at a certain point, you know, yes, I've got it. But in my case, then I, when I go to Steidl, I'm aware that we might start all over again. And for me, the true answer to your work is, a book never ends, a work never ends. And so the images start reappearing, the books start appearing in the museums, the muse you know, for me, as you will see in this exhibition, it's all connected and ongoing, and you see someone in Go Away Closer, then you see her in Little Ladies Museum, but then you see her also lying on the bed in Museum Bhavan. So characters reappear, the same images reappear. And that too is this wonderful part of photography, actually, that that can happen. So for me, the book doesn't even end because then there will be other books will come from it. All right. So the end is the beginning. Yes. Yes. It's, as my exhibition here shows me, my archive shows me, it's endless. It'll only end when I drop dead. Right. Well, I think that's an appropriate way to end. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dianita. Thank you, Steidel. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to say as an answer to what Gerhard was explaining about the luxury, Thomas, the, the question that you asked. This is the answer. This book of, how many pages was it finally? 300? 320. 320 pages. The book is for 25 euros. So I feel this is the future that we can't keep making books at 60, 70 euros. And certainly in the market from my part of the world, it doesn't work. So, so, so we have to do this. And it is quadro tone printed. Oh my God, really? It's beautiful printing. Please look at it, it's in the bookshop. You don't have to buy and it. smell it, put it. your nose in. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I guess the, good, the, the big question is, is it subsidized or not? We we'll, can discuss that another one. <laughs> yeah. Well, a very warm thank you to the three of you. And as Dianita said, ongoing conversations, our initial title actually of the exhibition. So we will continue with the conversation in a little, I think a little bit after five. So you all have time to have a break and maybe see the show. And I think you were saying, using the word touching a lot, an instant, and I think also how it described the, the intimacy with the book. And I think we will pick up with that and talk about this actually very intimate aspect of your work and, and also how you produce the photography. So I hope we see some of you in, in a little bit. Bye. I don't know. Maybe the mic is not working now, but I just, just to say, uh, Shani and me have made a special tea and cake in the cafe. And as a surprise, we're also going to be showing a video that I made out of my photos of Master G. So that's now, and the Mona video after Stephanie's talk, but that was a surprise for everyone who actually took the time to come here. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>